Well, um, I want to welcome everybody. Uh, we, oh, here we go. We got official announcement. Got it. Um, I want to welcome everybody to the First Coast Free Thought Society Zoom Room. We're an organization of individuals who prefer science and reason over religious dogma and fanaticism. We've enjoyed the non-religious community of Northeast Florida since 1998. We are now in our 24th year. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Meetup, and Instagram. We have Secular Sunday in the Park, book and movie discussion groups, the Freethinker newsletter, to which we invite your submissions. Even God has written for the free thinker. Our website is the First Coast Free Thought Society dot org or FCFS dot org. Same place. Now, I have a question along the lines of what Carrie was just asking. Is anyone here new to the First Coast Free Thought Society? And if you are, are you willing to raise your hand? If you are muted, unmute your mic now and, and introduce yourself if you're willing to do so. Because I have a question I'd like to ask. How did you hear about us? Anybody care to share? Maybe nobody's new. Okay. Unmute your mic. Yanella's got her hand up. I'm in downtown Jacksonville, and I've been to one of your meetings before. And I don't remember how I heard about you, but I really like the philosophy. So that's why I'm here. Thank you, Yanella. Appreciate you coming back. Anybody else care to share? Are you new to us? Joel, are you, Joel, you're muted. Joel, you're muted. Joel, Joel writes has written for the uh, First Coast Free Thinker the past couple of uh, issues. So I invite you to read the First Coast Free Thinker. It's actually pretty good. Go ahead, Joel. Well, this is my first first time actually have, uh, sitting in a meeting, but I have been uh, uh, trying to get to submit some things to the to the newsletter and i've really uh, enjoyed both uh, that opportunity but also reading uh so many really good ones including obviously the messages from god which is uh re really really fun to, to run to to read well thank you i'll pass that along to my, <laughs> my buddy all right my alter ego um any thank you joel for being here i appreciate seeing you and, and meeting you it's the first time i think we've actually spoken i appreciate it very much anyone else care to share how did you hear of us is this your first time with us it, no, it's okay all right i appreciate it well welcome to oh, well harold s has his hand up go ahead harold s sorry i was a little late hey everyone i am new i haven't joined a in-person meeting and this would be my first virtual meeting uh, with you guys uh, I am in Jacksonville as well, um, and I heard about you guys, I think, through meetup.com. Um, I think you were probably one of the top choices that appeared for me uh, in their algorithm on their website, and I just got really interested and decided to join. Well, that's good to hear. I appreciate, I appreciate that very much, Harold S. I really do. Thank you for being with us. Welcome to mm -hmm. everybody. Um, now, we, we are looking for interested people who might like to help shape the future of the First Coast Free Thought Society by becoming a, involved as a board member. If this sounds like something you might consider, then please contact me and I'll give you more information. We can have a chat about it. I'll give you some of the board requirements and some of what we do and, gi and give you enough information so you can make an informed decision. You can contact me through the website or my, my personal Gmail is kenhurley88 at gmail.com. Uh, but the website is probably a good way to go. Um, we're all volunteers here, yet we do incur expenses, largely promotion. We promote it online, on the radio, and in print. And if you know of a viable place for us to promote, please share, uh, like maybe college newspapers. We also have some associated costs for our website and fees for regulatory compliance, so as a 501c3. Uh, so if you can see your way clear to offer a donation of twenty fifty dollars or more you'll be part of the reason we're able to continue our public reach um so and we also are willing to send you a t-shirt for any donation of a hundred dollars or more just tell us your size and your color preference and we'll send that along to you and of course tell us your address uh now next next month monday july 18th 
we welcome priest Joe D from the Satanic Temple, who will discuss sobriety without superstition, a science of rituals challenged to the tenets of traditional 12-step programs. And then in August, we're taking the month of August off, so there's no meeting in August. Then in September, we're going to welcome Gina Gamba, who will offer a presentation about street epistemology, where we might learn whether or not the confidence in a claim by an inculocador is justified by how they arrived at their conclusion. Then in October, October 17th, and all these meetings are a Monday at 6.30, doors open at 6.15, we welcome Gwen Bradshaw, a former preacher's wife turned atheist who now hosts a radio program entitled Nude Radio. All right, now tonight, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Ryan Cragen, a sociolo sociology professor at the University of Tampa, who will present newly researched topic uh, titled Religion and Happiness, Much Ado About Nothing. Dr. Cragen is a husband, father, author, and a sociologist of worldviews. His research has been published in the Journal for Scientific Study of Religion, Sociology of Religion, and Social Science and Medicine, and elsewhere. You may learn more about Dr. Cragen at his website, ryantcragen.com. A discussion will follow Ryan's presentation, and should you prefer, you may message a question via the Zoom chat feature. Please mute your mics now and, but, uh, until it's time to speak, and be reminded that we are recording for posterity. Everyone who wants to speak, everyone who wants to ask a question will have ample opportunity to do so. So let's enjoy the time, the expertise, and insights graciously offered to us by Dr. Ryan Cragen. I understand he doesn't like to be called doctor. So Ryan, we are all yours. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me and thanks for the invitation. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I do have a, a PowerPoint. Is that working? Can everybody see that? Hopefully. Uh, yes. Okay, perfect. Yes. Uh, just wanna make sure. All right, so that's just the title. And this is um, a co-authored book chapter that just came out, came out in April uh, with a colleague of mine, David Speed, who's a psychologist uh, at the University of New Brunswick in Canada. Anyway, uh, a little bit of background, and actually there's a, quite a bit of background before I get to the numbers. I am a numbers guy, so you will see some numbers here, uh, but I'm going to try and keep it as simple as possible to make sure that <clears throat> everybody can understand this. Um, all right, so... Have, has anyone, and you don't have to answer this, rhetorical questions, right? Has anyone ever seen headlines like this? Religious people are happier. This is from a, a news article that came out in February uh, of 2019, probably based on the same study was another one. This is the Times, religious people are happier than atheists uh, study finds. That was also February, 2019. Uh, whenever I see these, I, I just get really, really aggravated. And a big part of that is because of course, I, I read this literature, but I, I, I study this and I know that these studies are very, very misleading. Uh, to, to illustrate this, I'm going to kind of dig deep into some of the background here and offer some background so you get a good sense of what I mean. Uh, but let me start with kind of just a, an illustration of where I'm going today. Um, if you learned that uh, some studies find that there is a significant positive relationship between religiosity and happiness. But some studies also find, or other studies find a significant negative relationship between religiosity and happiness. And then some studies find no relationship between religiosity and happiness. What would that lead you to think, right? So you've got some that say there's a positive relationship. Religious people are happier. Some say that there's a negative relationship. Religious people are not as happy. And then some studies find no relationship. Whenever you find this kind of pattern in any research topic, you should immediately become very skeptical. And I think this is the perfect audience to, to talk about skepticism, of course. And many of you are very skeptical individuals. But it's basically suggesting that there's probably not a whole lot going on here. Okay, we should be very, very skeptical. And there are five reasons that I want to give you for being skeptical. I'm going to cover them very briefly, and then I'm going to go into depth on each of these because they're actually really, really important. Uh, and the chapter actually covers them at depth as well. But five quick reasons why, and then we'll go into depth on each of these. So here are some of the serious problems with the literature looking at the relationship between how religious somebody is and how happy they are. Uh, first, most of those studies focus just on the US. In fact, the vast majority of those studies are only on the US and shocker, the US is weird. Um, 
very few of those studies actually use representative samples. We'll talk about that and why that's a problem. Most of them do not, do not report effect sizes. I'm gonna go into a lot of depth explaining what those are because they're actually really, really important. Uh, very few of the studies actually have uh, a causal component to them and we'll talk about what that means. And most of them have no theoretical rationale for why they think they would be finding what they're gonna find. So I'm gonna dig into each one of these problems uh, to some degree. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on each one of them, but I'm going to dig into them just so you've got a sense of why these might be problematic. Uh, so we'll start with the first one. Why might it be a problem to focus only on the U.S.? Okay. Uh, I'm guessing most of you can think of a number of reasons, but I'm going to point out two. First, among developed nations, the U.S. is disproportionately religious. And I do think it's important to, to recognize the U.S. is not, I've got a thunderstorm blowing in here, so hopefully I don't lose my internet, but um, hopefully you're all aware, right, that the U.S. is not as religious as people make it out to be. Only about one in five Americans are actually attending religious services on a weekly basis. So that's four out of five Americans, 80% don't go to religious services roughly every week. Okay. Uh, and we can talk more about the numbers, but the number of people who say they have no religious affiliation is going up. It's now about one in three Americans report no religious affiliation. And for the youngest generations, it's much higher than that. So we're not crazy religious in the US, but we are pretty religious. And of course, I had to put this picture up here because there is a significant portion of the electorate that really loves this idea that we're a Christian nation. It's called Christian nationalism. And the previous president pandered to that quite a bit. Um, so focusing only on the US, when looking at the relationship between religiosity and happiness, when the US is really very strange among developed nations is a problem. There's another key issue here. Uh, the US is also hyper-individualistic. Uh, a lot of other countries are much more collectivistic. The US is not as uh, collectivistic in terms of our values, right? We tend to put the individual above the collective and that's not true in other countries. So um, there are some serious problems with just focusing on the US and we're gonna see how this comes out. So just remember that this is a problem. Here's another problem. With a lot of the studies that are published suggesting that there's a relationship between religiosity and happiness, they don't use representative samples. A representative sample is a sample where um, everybody in the population of interest has an equal opportunity of being included in there. So if we wanted to study the US, we would have to have a representative sample of the US, meaning people from all the states, from rural areas, from urban areas, all different age groups, uh, different sexes, genders, et cetera. Everybody's got to have an equal chance. But what you often find in these studies looking at the relationship between religiosity and happiness is something like this. If I told you that older black women in rural Alabama who were religious were slightly happier than those who were not religious, would you assume that applies to the whole world population? And I, I kid you not, there are so many studies that look at, say, uh, there's one that I cite in the paper. Uh, it's only looking at elderly Chinese immigrants to California. That's a very specific population, but they use that to say that there's a relationship between religiosity and happiness. Others look at uh, rural Black women in uh, Michigan. Uh, this is a, another example. There's actually one that looks at older people in uh, Tampa. So I found studies on all of these really weird groups, but if you actually try and look at representative data, so nationally representative data, uh, you're not going to find it, and that's why they don't publish it. So this is really, really problematic, but the vast majority of positive findings use these really esoteric non-representative samples. Okay, now we're going to take a little bit of a technical turn. I don't know how many of you have a background in statistics, but this is a little bit of statistics, and I'm going to try and explain this as clear as possible. Hopefully it makes sense. If not, you can always ask me during the Q&A. Um, but most of the studies that look at the relationship between religiosity and happiness fail to report what are called effect sizes. And I'm guessing most of you are familiar with one aspect of this, but not the key aspect. Okay, so. What you've probably seen before, if you've read any kind of papers or even if you've seen like uh, survey results, is sometimes they'll talk about statistical significance. This is those p-values, right? Those magical p-values. Statistical significance basically just means that a relationship is so unusual that it's unlikely to be due to chance, okay? Um, I like to use an analogy to, to explain this. And I'm certainly not advocating that anybody play the lottery, but the lottery actually works really well for this. So 
statistical significance is kind of like winning the lottery. The odds are low that you'll win, but if you do win, that means that it's it's the equivalent of like it's statistically significant. There's a statistically significant relationship. Okay, so all I'm saying is the odds of winning are kind of like having a statistically significant relationship. But, and this I can't emphasize this enough. There's a more important component to winning the lottery, and that's how much you win. And this is the part that nobody seems to want to report in the research on the relationship between religiosity and happiness. Okay. So if you win um, a $70 scratch off, you technically won the lottery, but it's a $70 scratch off. Okay. Now, if you won $750 million in mega millions, okay, you really won. That's a big deal. Okay. But winning $70 in a scratch off is not going to change anybody's life. I don't know how many of you would even tell people that you won. You might be more embarrassed that you were playing scratch offs. Okay. But this is the part that is often missing from these studies is they'll say, oh, it was statistically significant. There was a statistically significant relationship between how religious somebody is and how happy they are. But then they ignore that the relationship is itty bitty bitty tiny. It's like winning $5 in a scratch off. It's meaningless. Okay, and we're going to come back to this because I'm going to show you this. If we kept finding really big effect sizes, so such that it was like winning $750 million, that would be a very different relationship. But most of the studies refuse to report their effect sizes. Instead, they just report statistical significance. So I'm emphasizing this because I'm going to show effect sizes and I want you to be clear what we mean by that. So there are two pieces statistical significance, you won effect size, how much did you win? Just remember that and it's important. Effect sizes can range from negligible, meaning there's nothing here to very large effect sizes. We're gonna look and see what those actually are. Okay, so kind of a little bit of a you know statistical side point, but important. Uh, another piece that a lot of the research looking at the relationship between religiosity and happiness fails to take into a consideration is causation. Okay, and you're all probably familiar with this phrase, correlation is not causation. Uh, as we think about this in the social sciences in particular, we kind of talk about three rules of causality. And there, this gets really philosophical. If you get dig deeper, I'm going to keep this really superficial and simple. The first one, A must precede B in time. So if we're trying to predict B, okay, A has to precede it in time. So you can't have you know, them both occurring or B cannot precede A, that's clearly not gonna work. A must be related to B in some fashion. So when A changes, B also has to change. That's the idea. They have to change together in some fashion. And then, um, actually I've got this reversed, B must be dependent on A or in, or in part and cannot be explained by some other variable. So this is spuriosity is what that's refers to. I, I need to fix that in my slides. But uh, basically, those are our three rules of causality. The gold standard when it comes to research is what's called experimental designs. That's where you can control most of the extraneous variables, the Cs, the spurious stuff. And then you can literally just manipulate one to see how that affects the other. Uh, that's really hard to do when it comes to religiosity and happiness. It's not like I can say, okay, you people, you're all going to be religious for this week and you people are not. And we're going to see how that affects your happiness. That would be super cool. And I do have an idea for doing that. We could talk about it in the Q&A if somebody remembers, but not with happiness, actually, with something else. Uh, that's really hard to do when it comes to social science research. The best next alternative is longitudinal research. So we gather data at point one in time, so T1, and then we gather data at a later point in time, and then we can look at stuff at T1 and see how that predicts stuff at T2. There's a little, little tiny bit of research that's longitudinal in this. Um, the results are actually very mixed. Uh, most of them also don't report effect sizes. I'm not addressing this one, but it is a problem with the literature. So you won't see me actually solving this one, but it is important to think about. The last piece that I want to mention when it comes to the five reasons why we should be really skeptical about the relationship between religiosity and happiness is theory. Theory is what we use to explain relationships. This is why we're trying to understand like, oh, why does this work? And I think we can ask very simple questions like this. Why would religiosity improve somebody's happiness? What is it about being religious or some aspect of religiosity that would improve somebody's happiness? And I think there are possibilities, but 
we can also just like question this and, and most people don't. So just having a religious affiliation, I don't think is going to make any difference whatsoever, right? Like th there's just no reason to think that somebody who's Catholic, who never goes to any religious services and has nothing to do with the Catholic church is going to be any happier than somebody who is not Catholic and engages in all the same behaviors. So affiliation makes no sense, but, but attendance might do it. Um, and, you know, this group, the free, uh, First Coast Free Thought Society, might be a good example of this. When you socialize, when you have a support network of people with, with whom you can hang out, that can actually improve your health and your happiness. So it may be the case that indirectly by having a support network, people could be happier, um, but it's certainly not just through affiliation. And then beliefs, why would believing in certain supernatural things improve somebody's happiness? Okay. Uh, some people might suggest, oh, well, you can cope with challenges in your life easier. It turns out there's a lot of evidence that people have negative coping when it comes to religion too. Uh, when somebody has somebody who's close to them who dies, they get angry at God. They don't think life's fair. They think it's unjust. They've tried to be righteous and now they're being punished for it. Uh, negative coping is just as common as positive coping when it comes to religion. So I'm skeptical about the beliefs. In my mind, the only thing that would make a lot of sense is if you're regularly attending Maybe you'd get some social support and maybe that would improve happiness, but the effects are going to be really, really small. Anyway, those are the five big problems that I see with this literature. And I write about all of this in that chapter. Um, but in my mind, that basically gives me five reasons to be very, very skeptical about this literature. Okay. That's what sent me down this path in the very first place. I kept seeing these headlines, oh, religious people are happier than non-religious people, they're happier than atheists, et cetera. And I kept thinking, I just, I don't think that's true. So what happened? This is how I got to this project that I'm gonna present about. Uh, I had somebody approach me. I've, I've written quite a bit about the non-religious and uh, the editor of this, this book approached me and said, hey, we'd really like you to write a book chapter um, about the non-religious and how they think about happiness. And I said, yeah, no, um, I, I'm interested in writing a book chapter, but I don't want to write that book chapter. I want to write a different book chapter. And book chapters are actually really cool because they're not journal articles. Journal articles have to follow a very specific format. You have to do all of these certain things and then it gets sent off for peer review. And you, if you don't do those very specific things, it's never gonna get published. Book chapters, you can take a lot of leeway and do things slightly differently. And I saw an opportunity. So I went back to the editor and I said, I wanna write this book chapter um, about <laughs> the non-existence of the relationship between religiosity and happiness. So I was approached to write the book. I said, I want to write this very specific chapter. And the editor said, yes, I could do it. So that led to what I'm about to describe, which is the book chapter. Um, anyway, so what did I end up doing? Um, I mentioned to some people who were on earlier, I really do enjoy data sets. I, like, give me a big data set and I'm just I'm ecstatic to explore it. Uh, there is this really large uh, data set. It's called the World Value Survey. They conduct it every four years or so, and it includes anywhere from like 40 to 70 different countries around the world and they're representative samples. So keep in mind, one of the problems with the prior research is they generally don't use uh, representative samples. The cool thing about the World Value Survey is it goes from country to country and will gather a representative sample, sometimes of you know 2000 people in each country, uh, anywhere from like 1,200 to 2,000, sometimes slightly more than that. And then they aggregate all of that into one big data set. So some of these data sets have hundreds of thousands of cases. Um, and to me, that's just delightful. Uh, I used the wave six of the World Value Survey. The data were collected from 2010 to 2014. All the data are publicly available, so anybody could replicate this. And I have all of my code because I, I use code to do this. But it included about 60 countries. Um, some of the countries were missing some key variables on, on some of the, the dependent variables. So they're not included in the analysis, but that's like three countries on some of these. Uh, but generally, I'm looking at about 60 countries around the world using representative data. Okay, so those are kind of the two key things that I want to point out. All right, so that's what I'm doing. Let me talk about my variables here. So my dependent variable, this is kind of key here, my dependent variable is Taking all things together, would you say you are not at all happy, not very happy, rather happy, or very happy? Okay, so that's my dependent variable, which is a measure of happiness. And, you know, self-reported measures of happiness aren't the best. There, there are other measures that are slightly better, but it's actually pretty good. People generally know how happy they are. 
Then we have our independent variables. So dependent variable is the variable that I'm trying to explain. The independent variables are the ones that I'm using to explain it. And then I'll talk a little bit more about what else I did. So I've got three independent variables because there are different ways that people can be religious. The first one is this one. Independently of whether you attend religious services or not, would you say you are religious, not religious, or an atheist? I hate this question. This is a terrible question, but it's the only one that simply captures whether people are religious or not. Uh, hopefully you can see why this is a really problematic question. Those last two response options, not religious and atheist, are not mutually exclusive. So you can be both, but you're not allowed to choose both in the survey, which is just mind boggling. I don't know who the idiot was who designed this question. Um, so I just combined them. So just so you're aware, not religious and atheist get combined. Religious stands alone. Um, but it's just a really, really bad question, but it's the only one that I had. Then I have this one, which is to capture belief, right? How important is God in your life? It ranges from one, not at all, to 10, very. And then the last one is behavior. Apart from weddings and funerals, about how often do you attend religious services these days, ranges from one never to seven more than once a week. And you'll note that basically I've tried to code everything. So higher religiosity is associated with higher happiness. So that's the idea that if we see a positive relationship, it means people who are more religious are happier. That's the idea, it should all be pretty straightforward, okay? So those are my uh, independent variables, my dependent variable. All of the analyses I'm gonna show actually include controls. So I'm controlling for age, I'm controlling for sex, I'm controlling not for race, because race gets too complicated, but po politics and education, kind of all the core demographic variables that you'd wanna control for. One last really quick technical side note, because this is also really important. And if you are not into statistics and you don't care about this, you can literally just kind of Close your, close your ears for about two seconds while I explain this. With statistical significance, you always have a risk of being wrong. It's about one time in 20 that you're going to be wrong. But if you're doing a whole bunch of analyses, like 50 significance calculations, which I'm doing 60 on some of these, um, in aggregate, your odds of being wrong actually go up, uh, which is a little bit weird. So there is a way to address this. It's called a home bonferroni correction. Total weird statistical side note, but for anybody who's really into statistics, I just want people to know we actually did this uh, because it's an important thing to do. Okay, so that's all the technical stuff now. Just want to be clear, at the very end of the presentation, I will have a QR code and a kind of shortened URL so you can actually download the paper, uh, the book chapter. It's free on my website, I'm not charging anything, of course. I want everybody to be able to read it, so I will have that link at the end. What I'm going to show right now, so we're getting to the numbers, are really simplified charts. These charts are not in the table, in the uh, sorry, not in the paper. The paper has massive tables with all sorts of details. This is the simplified version. What I'm plotting are effect sizes. Remember, most of the studies don't even show effect sizes. This is what I'm plotting, okay? All right, so let me explain. We're gonna start with our first one. This is the effect of religious identity, so whether you have a religious affiliation or not, on happiness. And I don't know if you can see my mouse. Yay, you can hopefully see my mouse. Um, I included these three just because I needed more. Uh, a, a chart with just three countries seemed too small to me. Uh, but these didn't even have a statistically significant relationship. Only these three out of 60 countries had a statistically significant relationship here. But over here on this side dimension, right, so on, on this uh, axis, I'm plotting effect sizes. And this is a very specific thing. Uh, any effect effect size below 0.1 is negligible, okay? So anything from here down is a negligible effect size, meaning it's not even worth mentioning. It's literally meaningless. There's nothing here. A small effect ranges from 0.1 to 0.3. Oh, sorry, a medium effect is from 0.3 to 0.5. And then anything above 0.5 is what we would consider a large effect. And a large effect is like winning the lottery, right? The $750 million jackpot. A small effect is like winning the $70 scratch off. So this is small. Anything below that is nothing. It's like you didn't do anything. Okay. So just to be clear, out of the 60 countries that I analyzed, and that's a lot of analyses, only three had a statistically significant relationship. India, Turkey, and the US between religious affiliation and how happy somebody was. And look at the effect size. On all three, the effect size is so small that it's meaningless.
there is not a meaningful relationship. Over here, again, I just threw these in because I wanted to put more, more uh, countries on this chart. These are not statistically significant. Just imagine if I had a chart with all 60 countries, these are the biggest ones and none of them matter. Okay, so I hope I made that clear. That's one of three different variables that I analyzed, right? This is religious identity or religious affiliation. Here's my next one. This is religious belief, okay? So this is the effect of religious belief on happiness. And again, I'm going to show you my metric over here on the axis, the left axis. This is going to show effect sizes. So anything from about 0 0.025 up to 0.15 is considered a small effect. This is a different measure of effect sizes. Uh, from 0.15 up to about 0.35 is a medium, and then anything above 0.35 is a large effect size. So what we have down here is like 12 to 14 countries. The relationship between religious belief and happiness was statistically significant in all 14 of these countries, okay? So out of the 60 or so countries that I looked at, 14 had a statistically significant relationship. And look how many have a small effect. Two, Rwanda and Malaysia are the only two countries out of the 60 I examined where there was an effect big enough to call it small. <laughs> it's a small effect. But, and here's my little twist, so there's got to be a twist on every slide. In Rwanda and Yemen, the relationship was actually negative. So of the 14 or so countries where there's a statistically significant relationship, in two of them, the happier you are, sorry, the more religious you are, the less happy you are. Just so we're, we got that clear. And one of those is actually the one that has the biggest effect size, even though it's basically small anyway. Uh, so just two of them have a small effect, Malaysia and Rwanda, and one of them, it's actually the inverse. It's, so it's a negative relationship, okay? So I hope I made that clear as well, but you should be noticing a pattern here. Uh, the subtitle of the paper is very intentional, much ado about nothing. Uh, here's my last one. So that's, we've got religious affiliation. We just did religious belief. Here's religious attendance. Same thing, about 12, 14 countries have a statistically significant relationship between religiosity or religious attendance and happiness. Here are my small effect size, medium and large. It's the same measure, the same uh, effect size calculation. Of all of those countries, and again, these are all statistically significant, one, one country has a small effect size, the US, okay? None of the others even have a small effect size. So hopefully I made that clear. I'm happy to go over this again in the Q&A if people have any questions, but this is kind of the major finding of the paper. And I've tried to simplify this as much as possible with these kind of, I hope, straightforward charts. Now let's discuss what we've actually got going on here, okay? So discussion. There is a statistically significant relationship between religious belief, behavior, and belonging, and happiness in a handful of countries around the world, okay? On that very first one between affiliation, it was three countries. On the others, it's like 12 to 14 countries, but the relationship is so small that it's meaningless, which means like this is, this is like you won the lottery, but you won $2 with your scratch off. That's what the relationship actually looks like when there is a relationship. Most of the time there is no relationship. What I would interpret this to be is that this is a subclinical relationship. No therapist should ever recommend religion as a treatment for depression or for somebody not being happy because one, in most countries, it's not effective as a treatment. And two, the effect sizes are so small that this would be malpractice, that this is literally recommending something that is less useful than, say, getting a good night's sleep, uh, than any number of other things. So bringing us back full circle to those problems that I pointed out with the existing literature and lots of studies, if we remember this, there are a bunch of problems. Many studies use the U.S. only. The U.S. was the only country, the only country that had a statistically significant relationship on all three variables. It was the only one. And on only one of those was the effect size meaningful. So looking only at the U.S. is a very serious problem because in the vast majority of the other countries we looked at, there is no relationship. Very few of the studies that find a positive relationship use representative, uh, re representative samples. 
I used representative samples. That's what makes this such a powerful study. These are representative samples from roughly 60 countries. And what do we find? Nothing meaningful here. There's almost never a relationship. And even when there is, it's, it's meaningless. Most studies don't report effect sizes. Guess why they don't report effect sizes? Because if you do, you very quickly realize that this is completely meaningless. So when it makes the news, when uh, you know some major news outlet reports that religious people are happier, uh, it's because somebody found a statistically significant relationship, but they're not reporting the effect sizes and the, re effect, si the effect sizes illustrate that this is a bunch of hooey. It's just a joke. There's nothing meaningful here. Um, I didn't address the causality stuff that's more complicated, but honestly, is there any reason to really deal with causality when there's no relationship? In my mind, there really isn't. Unless somebody can establish a strong, meaningful relationship between these two types of variables, there's no reason to even deal with this. And then lastly, there is no theoretical rationale here. Why would it make sense? It doesn't, it doesn't really seem to make sense. So all of those prior studies that seem to find a positive relationship between religiosity and happiness, I think it makes sense why they're finding that. They're focused only on the US. They don't use representative samples. They lie about how important it is because they don't report their effect sizes. They ignore causality and they have no theory behind what they're doing. That's the vast majority of the studies in this area. So what's my big conclusion? Religious people are not happier than non-religious people. Um, of course, we do not want to commit the ecological fallacy. These are statistics that apply to big populations. Uh, the ecological fallacy says those kinds of statistics don't apply to individuals. Of course, you could cherry pick this and find some really unhappy atheist and some really happy theist or vice versa. That's always going to be the case that you can find exceptions to the rule. But statistically speaking, that statement right there holds religious people are not happier than non-religious people, okay? That's the big takeaway from the, the uh, chapter. If you run into somebody who claims as much, ask them questions like, what's your source? What was the sample? What's the effect size? And of course, you can also send them my chapter. Um, you're all welcome to take this right now. If you've got your phone, you can scan the QR code over on the right. If you don't have your phone and you just wanna type it in, Right there, that shortened URL, I tried to make it short so you don't have to type in a whole bunch. That will take you directly to my professional website where the chapter is embedded and there's a link to download it. You can download it. It's a PDF. I'm giving it away for free. I'm not supposed to. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell the publisher. But I'm giving the chapter away for free because I think everybody needs to know this. And you can share that with whoever you want. Um, I'm, I, I'm happy to kind of have that shared all over the world. Um, I'm happy to leave that up too if anybody else wants to grab it or I can actually put it into the chat uh, afterwards, send people a link. But at this point, I am going to just wrap up and say, do people have questions? And I'm happy to answer any questions. Very good. Thank you very much, Ryan. I appreciate what you've, you've done. It's amazing. Um, yay. Every, uh, now, if you're going to speak, you can either use the uh, the Zoom feature to raise your hand or raise your hand and then I'll, I'll, I'll navigate, I'll try to facilitate the whole discussion that's about to ensue. Um, but one of, uh, one of the things that you, um, you, you talked about a lot about is the word happy. Mm -hmm. And I want to know if we agree that on the definition or it doesn't matter what the definition of happy is based on your uh, research, because if, if I were to define it, it would be a very simplistic definition. Mm -hmm. It would be something like the feeling of contentment and pleasure and joy. And it actually is mentioned happiness, the pursuit of happiness in the Declaration of Independence, right. um, life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. So my question to lead us off is, how do you, Ryan, define happy? Uh for the chapter or just me personally? Both. Okay, for the chapter, we don't, okay? So I can, that's a very easy answer is the survey asked that question, I showed you the question, taking all things together, would you say you are not at all happy, very happy, et cetera? So there's really no definition provided. We just kind of work on the assumption that people have a rough sense of what that means. Um, so I can, 
conveniently sidestep that question when it comes to the chapter and just say, hey, I'm letting the participants in the survey define that however they want to, and then they can rate their own happiness. For me personally, um, Ken, that's a, that's a wonderful question. Um, I I really hate trying to define happiness. I hate the whole idea behind happiness. Uh, I, uh, I almost take like a Buddhist turn here, which I'm, I'm not really a Buddhist, but I see myself, I, I see contentment as being more important than happy. Happy to me is more of a fleeting thing, right? Like I'm happy in the moment, I'm laughing, I'm having a good time, but I don't see that as necessarily the pursuit. Like who can be happy all the time? in that sense, right? Of laughing and smiling. Like anybody who's happy all the time, I get nervous around them. <laughs> What's wrong with them? There's something strange about them, right? I would much rather pursue for me personally, contentment, that I'm content with what I have. I, I don't feel suffering or pain, which I mean is good. You need to feel that sometimes too, but like, I'm just content. I'm not striving for like things that I can't have, et cetera. To me, that's a much more important perspective on happiness. Uh, is is really thinking about it as, as contentment. So I don't know if that answers your question, but kind no, of two answers. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Let's go to yeah. Richard Eason. Hi, Richard. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I'm a retired uh, State Department officer. I spent a lot of my career overseas, including about 12 years in the Middle East. I worked on economic issues a lot of the time, but also on terrorism issues and a whole range of things. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking only about the about the United States, but I find mm -hmm. the United States, uh, the average American is is very poor at judging statistics, very poor at having a mathematical understanding of the risk and in, in which is which their lives entail. I remember coming back from on, after 9-11 from overseas and driving by the St. Augustine National Guard post and seeing these massive concrete abutments put out to protect it against the Al-Qaeda attacks. I mean, to me, that's kind of a, a very exaggerated response to a threat that really doesn't exist because there's really no benefit from Al-Qaeda attacking the National Guard post in St. Augustine. It's not going to get him much, uh, uh, much news. And uh, even in terms of COVID, I mean, COVID's been, been horrible. We've had a million Americans die. But, you know, yep. in terms of the mathematics involved, it's one third or one percent. Yep. And, you know, the majority, uh, at least 70 percent of those were obese or had other secondary issues. So, I mean, just tap the entire country staying at home for two and a half years, I think, was basically an overreaction. Um, but again, to me, that's an assessment of risk. People who don't travel because they're concerned about terrorist attacks. Um, and I love the, the joke about somebody always carries a bomb on a plane because the chances of having two bombs on a plane are, are infinitesimally small. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I, I just don't think people can judge risk. They can't. They don't know no. the, statistics, the statistics for one thing, uh, which you gave a very good presentation of. Right. Uh, and they can't really make a judgment based on that either, which is a real problem. I mean, it's the same thing yep. with financial crises every, every few years. People can't judge the risk they're getting involved in with their investments and their hedging and other other tools. So, um, and I think it's, this is a very useful uh, presentation, and I just want to thank you for it. Sure, absolutely. Um, thank you for your comments, Richard. Yeah, thank you. Maybe later in the in, the, in our Q and A, you'll have a question too. Uh, uh, <laughs> David Schwambert, hello. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. Uh, I was actually going to make a comment uh, too. Uh, very good presentation, especially the statistical side. And I'm a political scientist, but qualitative. Okay, no worries. Quantitative. Uh, nevertheless, you know, as you know, if you're at a mm -hmm. small department in a state university, you're you have to be a sort of in, a utility player. Yeah, absolutely. So a million years, I used to teach a course called public opinion and interest groups. And one of the exercises I had my students do was I said, and I was talking about political surveys, uh, and that kind of stuff. And I, the exercise was make a question that's a neutral question for a political survey. Find out what you think about a candidate or an issue. Then make two more questions, slightly tweaking it to give a liberal bias that's hard to detect and slightly tweaking it to give a conservative bias that's hard to detect. And the students who really got into it told me, you know, I thought I made a neutral statement. And then as soon as I started to tweak it, I realized my original question was already biased. And yeah. so they had to go back and forth and back and forth. And the point was either intentionally or unintentionally, questions of a qualitative nature have a, are likely to have a bias. Yeah. And if you're already going in because you want to prove 
that religious people are happier or that atheists are happier, the likelihood of your being able to craft a sentence to get a neutral, you know, a neutral sentence to get an honest mm -hmm. response is very difficult. And it's more likely that you're going to bring your bias with you one way or the other. So it's a very difficult thing to do. So that is like an additional problem when you're yeah. dealing with these kinds of surveys to take that into account. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great point. Um, I, I've written about that in, in a couple of publications as well. So it, it's really, really hard to craft good questions in this area. Um, OK. Uh, I have a follow up before I ask that, yeah. though. Let's go to Fred. Um, I want to follow up on the biases. Um, Fred, you've got one, and then we'll go to Gary, then I'll ask my follow up. Sure. Um, I'd like to comment. I agree with Ryan about happiness. And um, it's like, I know throughout the day, I might be curious when I feel uh, happy, and other times when I might feel sad. But then, you know, there's just kind of neutral, not really feeling either, <laughs> really, way. Uh, right. Sometimes maybe even mad. Um, most thinking about in, um, say, in countries like uh, Saudi Arabia, where everyone's kind of forced to be religious, whether they really are or not, or it's dangerous right. to say you're not religious, yeah. or that you don't agree with the state religion, or in a, a country like Korea, where theoretically they're atheists, but really they have a kind of a quasi-religious relationship with the leader of the, of the nation. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, of course, they can't really take surveys, honest surveys in those sort of type of countries. Right. But uh, how do you think about what sort of answers they might have in those countries? <laughs> I don't know if the I, I guess work, but it's um, yeah. something that comes to my mind. No, that's that's a, a great question. So um, North Korea, we are, they're not included in the survey. So that, <laughs> that's easy. We can easily sidestep them. We do get some... Um, Muslim countries, and I use that, meaning that very intentionally, right? So these are countries where like, they're the Islamic Republic of such and such. Some of them are included. And you're right, we do run into some problems when you find that 97 to 99% of people in certain countries report having a religious affiliation. Um, so that can be a bit problematic because there's just no variation, right? So when you're running statistical analyses, you always want variation. If there's no variation, that becomes problematic. Where you do find some variation, though, is both on the dependent variable, how happy they are, and then in terms of attendance. Attendance gets a little bit tricky because in Islam, of course, attendance is a little bit different, right? They may go to Friday prayers, but women aren't required to, and men technically aren't even required to. Uh, and then, of course, in belief in God, it can get a little bit different as well. Um, I, I absolutely take your point um, in that when you said somewhere like Saudi Arabia, I don't actually have great numbers on Saudi Arabia, but in Iran, we find the same thing. If you leave the state religion, you can be punished. Um, so some researchers a couple of years ago actually did an, a completely anonymous online survey uh, of these were educated Iranians. So it's not a representative sample. But in Iran, where, you know, 95 plus percent report a religious affiliation, it was somewhere around 40% actually said that they were non believers. So in some of these Muslim countries, predominantly Muslim countries or actual Muslim countries, you're right to point out that there are a lot of people who actually aren't believers. They're not, they don't actually believe a lot of it, but you have to go through the motions. Uh, it's still, I just wrote about this, 11 to 12 countries around the world where you can be put to death if you leave Islam. Um, that's a problem. And so what you find is that people are going to lie unless they know that they're truly anonymous and they can say what they really want to say. Uh, so you're right, that can cause some very serious issues when it comes to data analysis and the data that we collect. Hopefully people are being honest with the World Value Survey. They are supposed to be anonymous, so hopefully they're being honest, but, but it could cause problems. It's a great point, Fred. I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you Fred. Um, we have a question from the chat room, it, oh. and, she, and she writes, okay, I'll bite with a little smiley face. I'm asking what you suggested. Oh. How in the world would it be possible to form an experimental design out of this? Okay. Um, thank you, Marilyn, for asking the question. That's awesome. Uh, so first of all, I would say uh, I, I have zero interest in actually doing that experimental design when it comes to religion and happiness, because I think this is pretty definitive. Like this chapter pretty much kills this, right? There's nothing here. This, it's not worth uh, exploring. However, one of my other lines of research has to do with health. 
and it's the relationship between religiosity and health. And I've put a lot of thought into this. Uh, hopefully, nobody's going to steal my idea. Granted, you'd have to get a lot of money to do this. But here's my thought on how to do this experimentally. Okay. I contact a whole bunch of free thought atheist groups across the country, and I get a big grant. And when I say a big grant, I mean like $10 million grant. And I will pay atheists. So I'm going to divide atheists. I'm going to randomly, randomly assign atheists into multiple groups. And I'll pay you $1,000 as an atheist to attend religious services once a week. Okay. You just have to go. You don't have to do anything there. You literally just have to attend religious services. My control group, you're just going to be atheists just like you normally are. But my experimental group, I'm going to assign you to attend a religious service. And maybe it's Catholic. I'd figure that out. Right. But I'll pay you money. And at the beginning of the study, I'm going to evaluate your health, objective measures of health. Right. So we're going to get like blood pressure and do all the blood work that we would need to and all of that stuff. I'll hire a bunch of people to do that. And at the end of one year, we're going to see, we're going to do the same thing, objective measures of health, and see if just going to church makes people healthier. That is an experimental design. And why it would work is because all of the participants are atheists. Okay. Um, and I think I could get a bunch of atheists for $1,000, knowing they're involved in a study, to actually do this. Um, and I think it would actually be a legitimate study, but it would be an experimental design, right? I can control the extra, you know, all of these variables. We are controlling for their health at the beginning. We're, you know, measuring their health at the end. And we could actually evaluate and see if just attending religious services actually influences somebody's health. That's amazing. Would you consider 2000 Absolutely. <laughs> uh, now I've got to get a $20 million grant, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> okay. I'm going to get there. How many, do, how many atheists do you need? Uh, I think I would have to have at least like 500 per. So we're talking at least a thousand atheists spread across the US. Um, I, I seriously have toyed with this. I've got these big grants right now that I'm dealing with. Uh, one is going to run for another four years or so. I've got to take some time off after that. But I, my, my co-author, David Speed on this, uh, we've talked about this, that like five, six years down the road, we're going to apply for a mega grant and we're actually going to try. We're going to try Great. to do that. That's thumbs up. Gary okay. Wittenberger, uh, you have a question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay, uh, Ryan, excellent study. Uh, I, I totally agree with all your conclusions. I do have one question. Sometimes we hear this uh, idea, religious people are happier than non-religious people uh, because they believe they will be reunited with their dead loved ones. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, great question, right? So that gets to the belief component. Um, I, I think, um, and there, there's not a ton of data on this. There's a little bit of data on this. There's not a ton of data on this. I think um, there are two pieces that we need to wrestle with when it comes to that issue. First, you're not sure you're actually going to be reunited with your loved ones because you might not be going to the good place. Right. So that's the first issue is you're not sure whether you're going to heaven or hell. You're only going to be reunited with them if you're actually going to go to heaven. Um, but there's always that unknown whether you're going to hell. OK, so that's the first one is it's not as clear cut as often people make it out to be is like, oh, we're all going to heaven. Right. Um, there's always that uncertainty. Um, so that that's the first piece. The second piece is. I always think it's fascinating, and it was actually a sociologist at the University of North Florida who pointed this out to me, uh, when you see really, really religious people crying at funerals. And <laughs> I was like, wait, what, like, why is that so fascinating? He said, if they really, really, truly believe that they're going to be reunited with their loved one, why would they be upset? And he pointed it out that I have a Mormon background. He also has a Mormon background. The prophet, so the, the head of the Mormon church, uh, this is a couple back, right? When his wife died, he was distraught, right? At the funeral, crying. And I was like, wait, that's actually a good point. If the prophet, the head of the Mormon church, right? Is distraught when his wife dies, does he really 100% believe that he's going to be back with her again? And so there has to be, not only is there like, oh, maybe somebody went to hell, right? But you can see that they're not 100% convinced that they're going to be with them. And that's reflected in something that they can't hide, which is their behavior, 
So you can actually see it in their behavior. So I, I think it's a really interesting question, right? That like, oh, they're happier because they think they're going to see their loved ones again. This gets to religious coping. I actually don't think that's entirely true. So there's some evidence suggesting that they are worried about whether they go to hell. And then on the other side, uh, how they behave suggests that they may not be as convinced as they really suggest they are. I, I hope that answers the question, Gary. I think it's a great question. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Sure. All right. Um, okay, Richard. Uh, Richard is back. Hello, Richard. You have a question? You're muted. You're oh. muted. Unmute, your, uh, unmute yourself, Richard. Sorry, does, is your data set broken down by religions? I mean, you know, can, you yeah. can you prove there's Catholic guilt or not, um, for example, <laughs> among other things? And secondly, uh, yeah. um, is, are you finding, I know your data set doesn't cover it, but are you finding that the number of non-believers is rising? Oh yeah, so that would be some different data. So on the first question, is it broken down by religion? Yes. I didn't split it out into different religious groups for this particular study. I was really just comparing the religious and the non-religious. Um, certainly, we could do that um, in, in a, you know, a different analysis and see whether certain religious groups are happier. I don't know that it's worth doing when there's really no effect here meaningfully. Yeah, uh, but on the, on, on the second point, um, I have, I've written extensively about the growth of the non-religious um, yeah, that UNF professor is Rick Phillips. Gotta love Rick Phillips. Um, I've written extensively about the growth of the non-religious. The kind of gold standard data set that we use is not the World Value Survey. The World Value Survey is fine, but it's the General Social Survey. Uh, the General Social Survey is conduct conducted by the National Opinion Research Center, which is affiliated with the University of Chicago. It's not technically part of it, but it's affiliated with them. Uh, they conduct a survey every other year. It's funded by the National Science Foundation, and it's considered the gold standard survey research in the U.S. because their response rates are so high. Uh, up until this last wave in 2020, their response rates were consistent above 70%. So they had really good response rates. Most of the Pew surveys that you see come out, their response rates are, well, they've changed now they have a panel. But before they moved to their panel, their response rates were like three to 7%. They were really bad, right? Um, now everybody's switching to panels. And we can talk about what those are. But the general social survey is kind of the gold standard when it comes to, to surveys in the US. It's every other year. And it's a representative sample. It's a probability based representative sample. So it's actually really solid data. And if you look at theirs, the, the transition to declining religiosity starts in 1990. And it's consistent pretty much every year after that. So every other year after that, you see an uptick in the non-religious. Uh, in 1990, it was seven-ish percent of the U.S. population reported no religious affiliation. In the latest uh, wave, 2020 wave, it was just above 28 wow. percent. So during that time period, right, from 1990 to 2020, we've seen an increase uh, of about four times, right? So it's multiplied by about four times. Uh, and that was just in the general social survey. Pew is constantly re re releasing data. Their panels are pretty good now, so I would actually go with them. They're putting the number at above 30% now. So we can see it. I mean, you can literally see it in trend lines. Um, there are a number of papers that are out. I can send you some if you're interested. And I've got a book, a forthcoming book, uh, comes out about a year from now, but uh, showing those same trend lines, but broken apart by cohorts. And the cohorts one is actually, I think, one of the more interesting findings, because basically what you see is, the oldest cohorts are the most religious, and then younger, every successive cohort gets less religious. But even though there's that difference by cohorts, all of the cohorts are trending away from religion as well. So it's not just that one cohort is doing this, right? So it's not like all the older people are dying off and they're the religious ones and younger people are less religious. That is true, right? But even among the older cohorts, they're leaving religion too. So this, this movement away from religion, it's affecting every demographic. Every race is seeing the same thing, uh, every gender, uh, every age group. It doesn't matter politically as well. And this is something that kind of, you know, people get, it gets lost in this discussion, like Democrats are all the non-religious. Nope. Turns out among Republicans, they're leaving religion too. So it's every demographic group is leaving religion. We're seeing it right now. It's pretty amazing. And so just to follow up, the age issue is not something that you're, you're, you're older, therefore you're, you're approaching your demise, therefore you might change your affiliation. Have you done time series data that you can tell yep. whether that happens or not? Uh, there's a very little bit of, you know, move. I mean, there's a lot of movement always, but uh, as far as people, like as they get older, turning to religion, 
we don't see it. Uh, okay. That was speculated in the 1990s. I'm thinking of one study in particular by Stolzenberg um, et al, where they were speculating because they saw they were right at the beginning, right? 1990 is when it took off in the US. So they were writing in like 1996 and they're like, we're seeing this uptick, but it could be that young people are leaving religion when they go to college and then when they reform their families, they come back to religion or maybe older people as they get closer in their recognized their mortality, they'll come back. So for a long time, they're like, oh, this uptick is temporary, right? It's just these young people are gonna leave and then they're gonna come back. Nope, we're not seeing that. Nobody's coming back. Once you leave, you're done. Um, so it, it's, it's pretty consistent. I mean, the, the data are pretty solid at this point. It's just not even being questioned. The, the book that I have forthcoming is called Beyond Doubt. Uh, secularization around the world. And we're basically just saying, hey, stop questioning this at this point. The data are overwhelming. It's You just can't even question it now. So. Thanks. Yeah. Who's publishing that? Uh, NYU Press, New York University. NYU. Press. Whoa, yep. that's fantastic. Yeah. Oh my it's a good one. That's ooh, thumbs up there. <laughs> yeah. That's thank really you. good. Who, um, um, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, uh, Joel R. has his hand up. Let's go to Joel. Or did I miss this? You're muted. Or did I? You I do just, have your hand up. right. Yep, I'm good. Uh, uh, just to let you know, uh, Ryan, I I have a PhD in industrial psychology and spent oh, nice. fifty years fifty years ago. You know all the statistics that you were talking about, but that was fifty years ago. <laughs> uh, anyhow, enjoyed enjoyed the the presentation very much uh yeah. you laid out uh the the uh procedure that you used for all your analysis and it was i, I just really enjoyed it um uh, also i want to uh i actually want to get in touch with you to use uh, some of this uh in some of the papers that i uh uh, essays that I write for the uh, newsletter. Sure. Uh, and uh, and I do have the icon to uh, uh, get over to your to your uh, to the chapter. website. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyhow, just uh, thank you. I, I enjoyed it very very much. Awesome. Glad oh, to hear. Very it. good, Joel. I appreciate your comments. I, I very much appreciate that. Um, anybody else have a comment or a question before I ask about bias? Uh, Angie DD. Uh, and Bud then we go to and Angie DD, and then we're going to go to Bud Emerson. After Angie, we're going to go to Bud. Angie, oh, you're muted, Angie. Angie? I don't know what happened to Angie. Oh, there we right, go. Let's go to Bud. Bud no, Emerson. She just she just unmuted herself. I think she's ready. Oh, is she? Okay, we okay. can go back to Angie. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep, we, we can, can Angie. Okay, Good super. Job. Hey, can you put the um the address for that PDF file back on the screen somewhere? Um, I, I just put it in the chat. Oh, okay. Let me take a look at that. Thank you. Yep. Great, uh -huh. uh, great good. observation. I also um. I'm frustrated by people's lack of understanding math and statistics. Yeah, uh, so, I hear you. So I can totally agree with you on that. Oh, yeah. And uh, I have all right, no so idea what you mean. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. <laughs> uh, just a, a bonus. My wife also has a PhD, and she's she's uh, yeah, she's deep into statistics. We debate statistics like around the oh, dinner table. Well, that's your, and all that was your stuff. wife. Uh, no, that was not my wife, but, uh, <laughs> but that is what we do in our house, right? We debate statistical things all the time. Like we're, we're big into numbers. We love that. Oh, somebody once told me you have the system. Tell me if this is true or not. And I, I know your answer, but somebody once told me to be in the lottery, you have the same chance of winning, whether you're in it or not. Uh, I mean, technically you have a slightly higher chance of winning by being in it, but it's, it's so small that it's no, I would never encourage anybody to play the lottery. Let's just put it that oh, way. Okay. There are ways to game it, right? If you have millions of dollars, you can increase your odds, but no, don't play the lottery. <laughs> it's All terrible. Right. All right. Bad investment of a dollar or two. Yes, Bud, exactly. Bud, let's go to Bud. Bud, are you there? Yeah. Where do you put somebody that goes to church every Sunday? has gone to church most every Sunday all of his life, but as a staunch atheist. Yeah. And let, and let me point out the fact that this group, 
was born in a discussion group of that church and all of its meanings when it uh, meets in mm -hmm. person are held at another one of those churches so uh where mm -hmm. do you put somebody who considers himself an atheist right but thinks of himself as being very religious yeah i mean are we describing unitarians <laughs> of, course. <laughs> of course yeah uh yeah i mean it's just the obvious conclusion there but uh this is part of the reason why when we talk about religiosity right and hopefully you've heard the term before um sociologists always think about it as multi-dimensional there are different ways that people can be religious um and I, I like to point out occasionally some of these numbers, right? So one third of the people, so uh, the general social survey, we're going back to the general social survey, it asks people's religious affiliation. So it says, you know, what is your religious affiliation? And people can list what their religious affiliation is. In a separate question, it says, regarding your belief in God, which of these response options most closely match that? And then you can say, I do not believe in God. So that's a separate question. So we can actually see people say, oh, I have a religious affiliation or I don't or whatever it is. And then later we can see their belief in God. And then there's a separate question that asks about how often they attend religious services. I like to point out that of the people who on the, the belief in God question, 30% um, of the atheists in the US, these are people who say, I have no belief in God, report a religious affiliation. <laughs> Okay, so 70% of the atheists in the US say, I don't have a religious affiliation, but 30% of the atheists say they do. Um, clearly, you can be religious in lots of different ways. And that's what I would get at with, with your question, right? There's absolutely nothing wrong with somebody saying, I'm an atheist, but I'm, a, I'm devoutly religious, right? In my mind, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. You're just recognizing the multidimensional nature of religiosity. That can be, people can be religious in lots of different ways uh, or not religious in lots of different ways. We're um, one of the grants that I'm working on the big grant out of Canada, we're actually working on the inverse of that, which is the multidimensionality of being non-religious. So what does it mean to be non-religious? How, how can you be non-religious in different ways? We've spent, you know, decades, centuries measuring the different ways people can be religious. What are the ways that people can be non-religious? And no one's really done that. So we're, there's a little bit of research on this. That's actually what we're trying to do with that grant is figure out the ways that people can be non-religious as well. Um, and, and, try and come up with better measures. Uh, but to your point, bud, absolutely. You can be an atheist, but also report a religious affiliation and go to church all the time. Yep, we see that in the data, right? I mean, it, it and think comes of out, yourself yeah. as being very religious. Yeah, absolutely. It, so, well, you know, you speak to the difference between the belief system mm -hmm. uh, and the hereafter and whatever the belief system might be versus the fellowship yep. and, the, and the camaraderie, camaraderie of the people that are, that are actually meeting with each other. Uh, and you, you've even said in your presentation that meeting people and being sociable tends to make people happier. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So whether or not it's in a church or it's not in a church, it really doesn't speak to the person's individual belief. It goes beyond yeah. just meeting people, though. I, I, I mean, it has to do with what we are. What do you mean? Oh, uh, what's his name? The, 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 the ant guy. He's written a, an interesting book. Uh, if there is a God, it's us. Oh, there's Eagle nothing. Was... There's nothing. There's no living thing on this earth except at our pleasure. In other words, if uh, I mean we we've got a coronavirus going on, but we'll wipe it out. Uh, so. <laughs> There's nothing that exists, no, no living thing on this earth lives except that we allow it to do so. Okay. <laughs> That's an interesting point. Okay, very good. Yeah. Um, Ryan, any, any, any further comment relative to that? Uh, no, I mean, I, I think he's, he's certainly recognizing the multidimensional nature of this, and I would strongly uh, agree with the idea that um, camaraderie, right? Like having a sense of community is, is really, really important. Uh, the research backs that up. So um, there's actually a, a couple of really good studies by a psychologist um, in Michigan, where he actually looked at 
members of a religious group and then also members of a secular free thought group. And he was comparing their health and happiness. And he found that there was actually no difference. So it doesn't matter so much which group you have, as long as you have that close net, close knit sense of community, you get the same benefits. It doesn't matter if it's religious or not religious. Um, so again, and I can, I, I'll send anybody the study if you if you email me and you're interested in that study. Uh, really solid research showing that it's the the network and the support group that matters, not the context for that support group. Right. So it's just having the support group doesn't have to be a religious one. Okay. Um, let's go but to Mary. Also, oh, go ahead. It Mary. also has to do with purpose of living and purpose of your life. Mm, the, the research wouldn't necessarily agree with you on that one, bud. Um, and, and, and the only reason I say that is there is quite a bit of research suggesting that looking at meaning, right? People's development of meaning. Uh, and it turns out if you try and correlate like meaning with uh, other health outcomes, how healthy people are, uh, how happy they are, um, how uh, objective measures of health. It turns out meaning doesn't really predict almost anything, which is, which is kind of surprising, right? I think a lot of people have this sense that like, oh, you have to have a purpose or a meaning. Um, and it turns out the data just don't support that. You don't so I'm, I'm not to... saying that it's a bad thing, right? I'm just, the data don't support it. Yeah. I've always said you don't have to know the meaning of life for your life to have meaning. Yeah. Uh, all right, Mary Wall. Let's go to Mary Wall. Thank you. Um, I just um, I'm want to observe that, you know, a lot of this, like so afterlife or whatever, would seem to be reminiscent of the Christian religion. There's a lot mm -hmm. of religions. And there's the idea of um, the idea that maybe people that are religious in terms of a doctrinal religion um, basically don't have any values or anything. Um, and well, I just want to point out, I guess, the difference between religion with a capital R and religion with a small R, which is more or less just a development of philosophy of life rather than um, being told what it is. It's a, you know, anyway, so anyway, there is a difference between organized doctrinal religion that tells you what to believe and I guess your mm -hmm. discovery of life um, on your own, so whatever, your development of a philosophy of life. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. Um, we, most of the countries in, included in this study would be formerly or currently Christian, predominantly Christian countries. Uh, there are some Muslim countries in there. There are some Buddhist countries in there. there uh, India is in there as well, right? So there are Hindu country. There is a Hindu country in the data set. Um, I, I think it's a good point to recognize there's a lot of diversity in religion and how people think about the afterlife, what they do, right? So the behaviors that are associated with the religions also are going to vary pretty substantially. All of that, I think, is important and, and, and important to recognize. Um, on your other point, Mary, about uh, you know the difference between organized religion and then people who are not religious and how they have their own worldviews, that's a good point, too. I, I, I certainly recognize that. And that's part of that research project that I'm working on right now is trying to figure out better ways to measure that. So I, I think that's a good point. Any follow up, Mary, you're good. If not, we'll go to Richard. And um, at some point, I'm gonna ask my question about bias. Go yeah, ahead, Richard. Just, just, just one more clarification about my personal observation about life. That mm -hmm. basically life is an opportunity to learn from humility, you know, from observation of the world around you and stuff like that. It's, doesn't um, um, come from, I guess, um, I know it all already. You know, right. experiment, the experience, a learning experience, not book knowledge doesn't always cover everything. And the opportunities, we have a little humility and maybe experience life, or maybe you see life is sort of, I guess, um, the seven blind men and the elephant in terms of perception. You know, so sharing experiences and learning through experience, both worth learning and experience would be you know, my position rather than, I guess, I'm um, absolute knowledge that basically I'm absolutely right about every religious thing there is, starting from, you know, Gaul or whatever. So, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I make the same observation in one of the first books that I published, uh, What You Don't Know About Religion But Should. Um, there's a chapter in there on religiosity and humility and arrogance. Um, uh, not that I'm trying to kind of encourage you all to go out. And actually, I think that's the one that I'll give away to anybody for free, right? If you email me, I'll send you that chapter because 
I, it's an important chapter talking about the differences in how religious and non-religious people conceptualize um, pride and humility, and then what's really going on there. So I absolutely agree with you, Mary. I think that's important that we should be open to learning always. Haldi, Haldi, you had your hand up. I wanted to make one comment about the, the study about causing atheists to, call, to go to religious services. It seems like that could have a really negative effect on their health do this from the stress that it would cause. <laughs> Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, I would hope that would not be the case, right? But uh, they would also be volunteers, right? So I'm not going to force anybody to go that you would you would be volunteering to participate. Uh, and then I would be Holdy. paying you. So Holdy, yes, this is Jeanette. You couldn't pay me a million dollars to go. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. Jeanette just ruled herself out of the study, right? I yes. don't have a million dollars just to include her. Uh, oh she goodness. said oh, she wouldn't even do it for a million dollars. So I, I, I'll go. All right. Yeah, I'll <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Richard Eason, back to Richard. Yeah. yeah, just a comment. My father was a Methodist minister. He had a very academic approach to studying the Bible. He learned Aramaic, Hebrew, Latin, and New Testament Greek. Um, I think he saw it more of a social welfare kind of a career that he had, that he had a community that he was helping with many issues. I mean, he was dealing with many issues that weren't remotely religious. My mother was the same way. I mean, she was the preacher's kid, the preacher's wife, so she was always heavily involved. But I think the last couple of decades of her life, I think she was just as much of an atheist as I was. We just never had that conversation. My sister married a non-practicing Jew. They go to church every Sunday. They sing in the choir. Uh, I don't think they've ever, at least as far as I know, ever believed in any of the religious aspects. It's the community <laughs> aspect yep. that's key to them. And I, my, my sister also likes to be a leadership. Well, she's, she, she preaches a sermon sometimes when the, when the pastor's away. So, I mean, I think it's, it's more, it's, it's as much of a psychological reward that doesn't really have much to do with religion in a lot of cases. Yeah, I think that's certainly true. A lot of people find community there. Um, I, I shared a stage once with Daniel Dennett. Um, some of you are, I'm sure, familiar with uh, his work. And that was actually one of his concerns with the decline of religiosity. Uh, that he expressed both on the stage and to me uh, at dinner later is the collapse of community. Uh, and I think that's a fair point. I, I, I genuinely do that if we cannot find ways to replace the sense of community that we get through religion uh, with other forms of community like this, or you know, whether it's a bowling league or um, I happen to play magic with my son and I play D&D &D with other people. And like, um, there, are, there are ways to replace that, right? But if we don't replace it, I, I genuinely do see that as a concern. We, we need to have a strong sense of community that's actually been shown repeatedly to be good for our health, uh, mental and physical health. So, so valid point. Very good. Other comments, other questions? David, you just had your hand up and you took it down. You done, you okay? Swan um, Baird, are you? Well, I was just gonna, to add another dimension since this kind of stuff came, comes up, it's uh, there's also the element of identity politics. So I know people, for example, whose heritage is Italian and they're atheists and agnostic, but they have all sorts of uh, Catholic iconography and, and uh, artifacts in their house. Right. Uh, you know, to be, you, you can be an Italian communist <laughs> and Catholic, Catholic culture just infuses your identity. And yeah. uh, I remember reading, I'm Jewish uh, and proudly so, but it's an ethnic cultural association. It's not a religious association. Uh, the state of Israel was founded by very uh, atheist, anti-religious uh, groups. So being Jewish is confusing to a lot of Americans. They right. assume, oh, you say you're Jewish, you're right. And uh, Jimmy Breslin, who is an Irish Catholic writer, said, you know, I'm an atheist, but I'm Catholic. I'm a cultural Catholic. You know, so the identity yep. politics is also tied up with religious something or other. And that's yeah. hard to separate out, too. Yeah, it is. Um, there are a couple of good books on this by uh, an anthropologist, actually, from the UK, who was finding that very thing in the UK when she was doing her initial interviews um, that people would say, oh, well, I'm British, so I'm Christian. And then she'd say like, <laughs> well, okay, but but do you believe in Jesus? And I'm like, of course not. That's absurd, right? Like, I don't believe in Jesus, but I'm Christian because I'm British. 
Um, and she did find that for a certain age group, once you get into younger generations, that connection between being British and being Christian is actually starting to disappear. So it, that's probably not going to continue indefinitely into the future, but certainly that's the case in a lot of countries still. Um, it, I, I mentioned that I was just in, traveling in Norway. Um, Norway is one of the most secular countries on the planet. Uh, I, while I was there, we were walking around on, on a Sunday, and I found out later from a tour guide, uh, I was in Bergen, which has a, you know, it's a population of 300 and something thousand people. They have seven, I think, still extant medieval churches, uh, and then a couple of other more modern churches. They open one of them in the city each week uh, for services, because if they opened all of them, they would have two people in attendance at each service. So they've just decided we're going to open one and then we'll get 20 people. <laughs> and that's literally what we saw. We happened to walk by just as they were letting out. And I counted, it was somewhere between 15 and 20 people left the church at the end of the service. So, and I bring that up to go to your point, still at something like 80% of Norwegians say that they're uh, a member of the Norwegian church, right? The, the state church, which is now no longer affiliated with the state. Um, but nobody goes to church and most of them are atheists. So it's part of their identity as a Norwegian to say, I'm part of the Norwegian Lutheran church, but they don't go, they, it has no bearing on their life. It's, it, I fully get your point. It's a good point. Other comments, other questions? Or Ryan, other comments, other questions? If not, I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, what, who, who do you hope, or, well, let me ask it this way. Have you done any research based on your research as to who will be persuaded by your research? <laughs> uh, yeah, um, good, good question. That's a very meta question. So um, I did mention I've got a book forthcoming. I'm working on another book. We just submit, submitted the proposal to the same press, NYU Press. Um, that one is looking at people who leave religion in the US. And I wish, I, I, this was literally my dissertation back in 2007. So I've been working on this issue for a long time. I wish we had a very simple statistical model where I could just put it together and say, people who meet criteria X, Y, and Z are going to leave religion. We cannot do that. Um, there is not a good way to predict who is going to leave and who is not. We have certain groups of people who, if they have this characteristic, are maybe somewhat more likely. I think that's fair to say. Uh, so men are more likely to, younger people are more likely to. If you're LGBTQ+, you're more likely to leave religion. Uh, if you're higher educated, Though that one gets complicated, it's particularly true for women, less so for men, you're more likely to leave religion. So there are a number of factors, but you would assume that all of those factors would like stack up, right? So if I had like a highly educated, young LGBTQ individual um, living in Oregon, right, who uh, is uh, married to an atheist, they should be extremely likely to leave religion. But the models don't support that. <laughs> it's weird. Statistically, we cannot clearly predict who's going to leave. And so I wish I could say, like, this is the perfect audience for my research. These are all the people who, if they read it, they're going to leave. Uh, no, um, it doesn't seem to bear out that way. Uh, probably the strongest predictor, though, I will, I will give you this, the strongest predictor of who's going to leave has to do with social networks. So uh, if you're a young person and uh, you, know, you grew up religious or whatever, and you end up cohabiting with a non-believer, your odds of leaving go up pretty substantially. So th that we can predict that social networks, if you know, your social network shifts to mostly non-religious people, and then you're violating your religious principles by cohabiting instead of marrying, uh, your odds go up pretty, pretty substantially. But beyond that, we really cannot predict very well who's going to leave. That's one of the big takeaways of that book, which I wish I could. I've been working on this for you know fifteen plus years, and I I don't have an answer. If if you could do your research on the last piece differently, mm -hmm. not based on what you're going to do next, but what right. maybe maybe this is the correction. What would you do differently? Uh, well, um, my my dream study 
uh, other than the one that I talked about, right, where I pay a bunch of atheists to go to church, which I think it would be hilarious right. and a lot of fun. My dream study would actually uh, have started in 1990, and I would have had, I don't know, 5,000 uh, eight-year-olds, and I would have tracked them every year, right, for the next right. 15 years uh, using longitudinal data, tracking their religiosity, their friend networks, how often they go to church, what they're reading, like really detailed information about their lives. I think that might actually give us the best hint at who's going to leave if I had that kind of data. But we don't, no one's done that, right? No one's done that. And it might be too late. It might be too late at this point because so many people are leaving. I think that's part of why it's become very difficult to predict who's going to leave is because it's not an obscure thing anymore. Most of you are probably in the vanguard of people leaving, but that's not the case anymore. So many people are leaving. It's now really hard to predict who's going to leave. Well, is, why do people stay? Uh, that's a good question. Um, that's actually a really good question. I think social network also matters quite a bit for that. Uh, another thing that really, uh, <laughs> I, I, I also write about this in that first book. I don't mean to, again, keep pitching that first book, oh, but it's a really fine. good book right. if you're interested. Um, in that book, I found some data I want to say it was from the late 1990s, again, from the General Social Survey, that was asking people about whether they've ever questioned their religion. And 60% of people in the late 1990s, so that may have changed, we don't have uh, more recent data, 60% of people had never questioned their religion. And uh, what that leads me to conclude, okay, is that there is a sizable percentage of any population that's just, it doesn't matter to them. Um, they're gonna continue on the path that they were set on when they were kids. And that's just really not gonna change unless something substantial really hits them, right? Um, and I, I can think of like family members of mine. I, you know, I, I mentioned I grew up Mormon. I'm one of nine kids. A lot of the members of my family just are never gonna question these things. It just doesn't matter to them enough to question it because it works fine for them right? This is life. This is what I do. So once you get into that pattern, it's just not a big deal. You just kind of keep going down that pattern. Um, it often takes some sort of shift, a change, something important or dramatic happens to lead people to start questioning things. Um, and then, then they can choose the direction that they go. So I think for a lot of people, they don't ever question. Um, they're comfortable. It works for them. And their social network is such that they're surrounded by people who are just like they are. So there's no reason to change. Somebody once told me it hurts to think and to question causes you to think. And once you start thinking, then you've got to challenge your own personal viewpoints. And once you do that, you're going up against all of your, your, your parents, your grandparents, yep. your traditions, and that becomes a very difficult thing. So it's very simplistic to stay. Yep. It's, it's easier, easier in it's a lot easier of to stay. Exactly. It's easier in a lot of ways. Let's go to uh, Fred W. Hill. I'd like to comment, I think uh, another factor is, uh, you know, especially in a small town, it seems to me that um, most people are going to keep mum about their real yep. belief and pretend to go along with everyone else because, well, everyone else is pretending. And some of them, you know, maybe 52% you know, are real believers, maybe another person mm -hmm. that's too afraid to say what they really think. And then, yep. uh, and then there, there are some people I've encountered that when I Hold them as an atheist, so I go like because they never heard anyone say that before. Right. They just heard anyone say, "You really don't believe?" Yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes even people I know for several years and just somehow never came up, and then when it is like they were just like you know just amazed because no one had ever you know caused them to question what they were brought up to believe. Yeah, I'm talking about all sorts of religion. I mean, one was a you know, Mormon himself, though he. You know, someone new in the Navy, he wasn't a practicing Mormon, but that's what he grew up with. And right, it is, you know, uh, someone I lived with for a couple of years, and the uh, you know, topic came up, and he's like, you know, but he, he thought like a lightning was going to strike us. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I wasn't thinking, um, the comment before about people beliefs about the afterlife, and I said, well, maybe I don't, I won't go to heaven, or or maybe they've really gone to hell, but also there are a lot of people I know. Mm -hmm. They don't really get along. They didn't really get along with the dead loved ones. Or they had significant <laughs> disagreements with them. Or, or they um, or they remarried two or three times. Right. And then we have, you know, those, you know, they're or they're uh, you know, so it's like just you know, it's kind of complicated. They might have even got they 
Too many that got really gotten along with their fathers or mothers or so forth or grandparents. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like to me the only way heaven could work is if everyone were completely lobotomized, <laughs> completely stoned out of their minds, so they would uh, all just be in a stupor and they'd be real happy because they're not capable of thinking. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a great point. I, I know someone quite well who um, is now a non-believer, right? But has has made that point very clearly. Um, she had awful relationship with her mother. And so um, the idea of going to live with them after they die is just like, it's like torture, right? She would much rather go to hell, um, which raises another point. I don't know how many of you have read Mark Twain's book about uh, heaven. Um, if you haven't read it, it's an absolutely delightful book. Uh, I forget the name of it. It's like, so-and-so goes to heaven, and it's just absolutely hilarious. Uh, I strongly recommend it. Uh, one other quick response in, in, to Fred's point about um, you, you, don't, you don't really hear a lot of people say this. I, I did a study a long time ago. I have yet to publish it, but it had to do with conformity. Um, I had this idea, and some of you have obviously been to church services, you've been to religious services. Um, I'm not thinking about Bud. Bud, the Unitarians are different here. So to just be clear on this, right? But I'm, I'm talking about like Catholics or Mormons or, you know, Pentecostals or something like that. Have you ever been in a religious service where the pastor says something, you know, talking about some belief and somebody notably and publicly stands up and says, I don't believe that? See, it, it doesn't happen because we are conformists. Um, all of us are. There's so much social pressure to conform. We know that there are atheists sitting in pews every Sunday in the U.S. We know there are, but how often do they say that? And what that ends up doing is it reinforces in everybody else's mind that everybody believes. So it would be delightful if the atheists would actually say, like, I'm in church, right? I like the community, but I don't believe what you just said. Um, we know they're there, but no one ever says it. And I think that actually has a very powerful effect in convincing lots of people that everybody believes, when in fact, there's probably a lot of diversity of belief in any given congregation. It's just people aren't willing to stand up and say it. Are you referring to the Bible according to Mark Twain, writings on heaven, Eden, and the flood? No. Oh, what is it? It's sorry. Oh, I've got to find that book. Okay. Um, well, I Mark Twain was an atheist. He was. People. Yeah, but he didn't. He didn't share that with the world while he was doing his Mark Twain writings. He, there he, it is. Right. It's he, Captain he, Stormfield Goes to Heaven. Oh, there you go. Oh, such a hilarious book. You absolutely need to read it if you haven't read it. It's Captain Captain Stormfield's Visit to Heaven. <laughs> Such there a you funny go. Book. Thank you. I'm because I was trying. To, thank you for remembering. yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks for remembering. Thank you. And it's for a short for story. It's a very um, short story. It's a great story. You should right. absolutely read it. Um, this is that one one really quick comment though, just to what you're saying, because the biggest problem I have found the reason you couldn't pay me enough money to go to a church is at least here in Florida, it can be absolutely frightening mm -hmm. to to i am terrified of actually being killed in some of these churches um for my beliefs and i i you i the, i think that's why a lot of people don't say anything the fear of excommunication the fear of you're, you're not supposed to question. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it can be terrifying. I, I absolutely agree with that. And certainly, I mean, <laughs> I, I do actually, um, I go to church uh, about once or twice a year. Um, it, it's, it sounds terrible to say this. I probably shouldn't say it anymore, but it's like a biologist going to the zoo, right? I, I'm not going because I'm interested in like joining. I'm going because this is my job. I observe and study religion, right? Um, I am selective in the religions that I go to. So which services I go to, but it's absolutely fascinating for me as a sociologist to go to these services and to watch what's happening and to observe. Um, and of course, you know, I try and be respectful. I'm, I'm going to be quiet and I'm not going to disrupt or anything like that. And I'm not, 
I'm also very clear about why I'm there. I tell them very quickly, I'm a sociologist. I study religion. I'm just here to kind of observe. Um, this is what I'm interested in doing. Uh, but there are certain religions where I, I don't know that I would feel that comfortable going. That said, I've, I mean, I've been to Pentecostal churches where I've watched people be slain in the spirit and collapse on the floor and convulse for 30 minutes. And um, I, like I've seen all sorts of crazy stuff. It's fascinating to do. Um, I, I probably also have the privilege of being, you know, a fairly tall, athletic, young, white male, um, which gives me a lot of privilege that I can go places where other people probably shouldn't go. So, so I, I recognize that as well, right? I, I have a lot of privilege when it comes to being able to do these things, but use but your yeah, tools. I, yeah, yeah, use my tools. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, well, there's obviously there's some fear lurking mm -hmm. in this in this Zoom sure. room. Um, uh, Fred, your hand is still up. Do you have a follow up or are you, uh, you, you good? Uh, otherwise, let's go to Mary. Mary Wall. Hello, Mary. Once again. Hi. Just a quick comment on um, the church and change. I guess you know, from 2000 years ago till now, there's been a lot of change. Um, mm -hmm. If you remember the Dark Ages, there was a certain resistance to admitting the earth was not flat, yet it is not. There was, I guess, suppression of any sort of knowledge other than the Bible until the invention of pigeon press. And um, so um, anyway, there was Renaissance and stuff like that. And knowledge, whether it's good or bad or whatever, seems to you know continue. And it seems like in terms of philosophy or whatever, life, philosophy of life or any religion, some of these differences, you know, might involve some religious philosophy or moral philosophy or something. And, you know, I guess static things, although routine seems to you know, be encouraged mm -hmm. security or a sense of security or whatever, and that shouldn't necessarily be thrown out, that basically an ability to consider new things, you know, is not always a bad thing. So whatever. Yeah. Come yeah. not, ex you know, exiled to Alba. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I see a couple of other hands up. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Mary. Susan and Earl, you're muted. So I just, I saw Ryan Cragen when he was at the Free Thought Society a couple of years ago, and it was so funny. And he was suggesting, I guess I should say you were suggesting, since you're right here, I don't have to refer to you. <laughs> you were suggesting we quit saying, uh, Mary, Christmas, or we ad we adopt the various religious holidays mm -hmm. to incorporate them into our life. So just like the Christians adopted the pagans, and now yes. atheists can adopt the Christians one. But I wonder if it's going a little bit the other way as well, because um, someone I I I met, and she is a religious person, I suppose. She runs a church. But she recently posted that she doesn't have to believe the Bible is literal. She doesn't have to believe that Jesus existed. They're all parables to teach right. a story. So I wonder how many religious institutions might and embrace the benefit of community without having to believe some of the myths. Yeah. Um, so for those who are, are not familiar with this, I did in one of my books, um, How to Defeat Religion in 10 Easy Steps, I argued that if secular people want to win, um, defeat religion, we need to engage in syncretism, right? And syncretism is basically co-opting different ideas and pulling them into religions. And this is what religions did for a long time, right? They syncretized all the holidays uh, that were pagan holidays. Um, and turned them into Christian holidays. And so the argument that I made is we need to out Christmas the Christians. Um, that way we co-opt it, we make it secular, and then we can do whatever we want. So I think that's a really interesting point um, with, that, that Susan was making there. Um, the way that I would frame what you just described, which is this uh, religious individual saying we don't have to be as orthodox as we used to be, we can be more kind of liberal in our interpretations of things, that's secularization. That's, that's literally secularization. Um, and it sounds weird to say that religions are secularizing, but religions do secularize. All that means is that they're, they're moving away from um, these strict fundamentalist orthodox perspectives on things and trying to move more towards accepting modern sensibilities and modern values. Um, 
And if, if the end goal is that people move towards those values that I think most of the people in this community, in this group uh, share, right, which is secular values, um, that's actually a win. So even though religions, they're doing this because they know they're losing numbers, they're losing members. Uh, there isn't a religious group in the US that's actually gaining members, uh, except maybe Islam, which they're not really a religious group. They're, you know, not, they're not hierarchical and it's all through migration. Um, otherwise they're all losing. They're all losing members. So they're doing anything um, they can I'm to try and bring people I'm sorry to have to tell in. you this, but Wiccans are growing also uh, at a disturbing rate, don't you think? not exactly really, uh, it's also know? a really no they're not they're not growing rapidly right they're they're growing oh. a little bit but it's also All a right. diffuse religion so it's not hierarchical right All so right. it's hard to describe it as a religion because okay. who's in charge thank you right? for explaining that yeah, yeah. So every Wiccan is basically in charge of themselves. It's a religion of one, uh, which is great. I have no problem with it. I'm not trying to be the demeaning of Wicca at all. I think it's great, actually. Uh, but it's it's not growing rapidly. Uh, it's growing a little bit, and it's a diffuse religion, so it's hard to say that it's actually seeing growth. Anyway, um, but back to that point. I, Whenever we see, uh, I use Joel Osteen for this in one of my books. Joel Osteen, I, I actually read one of his books specifically for this. He, in his entire book, makes like seven references to hell. Um, and it's all references of like uh, when hell freezes over, right? He's never engaging in the hell and uh, the fire and brimstone kind of hellfire, like, you know, you're all going to hell if you're not obeying and you've got to follow these, you know, laws and you, you can't sin. He just doesn't do that anymore. And he's a very popular pastor because he's basically engaging in pop psychology with loose references to the Bible. He's secularized. Joel Osteen is a very secular pastor. Don't get me wrong. I think he's awful. He's, you know, uh, fleecing his flock to huge numbers. So there are all sorts of other problems with what he's doing. But what he's done is secularized religion. And whenever you see that happening, I actually kind of celebrate a little bit inside because that means we're winning, right? We're winning because they can't keep saying the same crazy, batshit crazy stuff about, you know, donkeys talking. Like people just don't believe that shit anymore. They just don't. And so they have to adjust and they become more modern and more secular and they move in our direction. That's a, that's a win in, in my book, right? And right. I, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, Ryan, I didn't mean no. to interrupt you, but You're good. I, I want to latch on to you, your word winning. What does winning look like? Suppose there was no more religion. How would mm -hmm. that, how would that, how would the humans mm -hmm. change their behavior? Would it just be different terminology, but the behavior remains the same? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's another great question. Uh, in the, 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 the other book I mentioned that I'm still working on, uh, our very last chapter actually addresses this. We hit like 10 points of like, what would change if everybody became non-religious? And I don't think that much would change. Right. Uh, except we would start taking certain things out of our uh, discourse, okay? So there are certain, certain issues that are primarily motivated by religion. And I don't mean to be political. I try not to be political in a lot, you know, my presentations because I know these groups can have a lot of different uh, political positions. But um, opposition to transgender individuals seems almost, to me almost entirely rooted in religion. Um, I don't know that that's entirely true. I think there are some people who are, you know, not religious who are still opposed to transgender individuals. But, but I think if you, if you take religion out of the conversation, then attitudes on certain things are going to shift. Um, we would stop having opposition to evolution. <laughs> like something that simple, right? That there is still adamant opposition to, to evolution among about a third of Americans. They are absolutely opposed to this and they don't want it being taught in our schools. And what does that ultimately do to the educational quality in the US when we have people saying, you can't teach my kids about evolution, which is just a fundamental principle of biology. Like nothing in biology makes sense without evolution. And it's religious opposition that does that. So do I think there'd be radical differences and like we'd suddenly be a much better society and we'd shift in all these? I don't think there'd be radical differences, but I do think there would be some really important key differences where we would shift away from certain positions because those the position is defended only on the basis of religion. I hope what that does makes winning sense. What look like? 
Um, uh, yeah, I probably shouldn't have used that language, but but uh, winning in my huh? It's too late. I know. I, I let the cat out of the bag. Winning in my book uh, is not that everybody becomes non-religious. I actually don't care about that. Uh, again, my first big book that I published on this, what you don't know about religion but should, I make this argument. I have no problem with Unitarians. I think Unitarians are great, right? I have no problem with uh, Reform Judaism. I have no problem with that whatsoever. So if you uh, and actually, uh, somebody mentioned, uh, I think, it was, oh, no, I'm forgetting who it was. Richard, Richard said this, right? His dad was a, a Methodist pastor, okay? I have a very close friend. She is a member of the United Methodist Church, which they're splitting, all right? So she's going with the left side of that, so the left-leaning side. I have no problem with her beliefs. She fully embraces science, okay? She she accepts every aspect of science and... Um, continues to say, well, I think, you know, maybe, maybe there's a God. I, I have no problem with people like that, uh, where they're not rejecting certain aspects of reality on the basis of their religion. If there are still religious people a hundred years from now, and that's where it is, then I would say we've won, right? I have no problem with people saying, I want to be religious and I want to believe this. And I want to believe there's a God and some, some supernatural things that we can't demonstrably prove to be not true that's perfectly fine with me, right? As long as it's not inspiring you to like shoot um, gay people, right? Like don't do that, right? That, that's a problem. But if, if you're basically accepting reality and then you want to put a layer of belief on top of that, then I think we've won, if we can get to that place. Mm. Okay, fair. Um, other comments, other questions? Uh, other com uh, Joel, oh, hey, Joel, unmute. Just a question, uh, Ryan. Do you consider yourself a possibilian? A, a possibilian? You're going to have to define that for me. Yeah, define that for me, Joel. A possibilian is a person who uh, will accept any any uh, statement about anything, uh, but requires some facts and data in order to back up. What the other person is saying, but but the initial uh, the, the initial he, he he developed this whole notion, and and the guy is a, uh, a professor of I don't know neurobiology or something uh, mm -hmm. down in uh, uh, Texas Baylor I think. At any rate, if you go to the uh, Ted Talk, he, he, he originally talked about this 15 years ago in 2007 at a TED mm -hmm. Talk. But if you Google possibility, it, it, it's, you, you will come up with this video, which will both really entertain you, mm -hmm. but also introduce this notion that uh, the conversation about science versus religion uh, atheism versus, you know, whatever. Right. The, the, the conversation changes as soon as one goes into it with, you know, I'll listen to anything. Mm -hmm. But as you have pointed out before, all I want to see is the data. Yep. Uh, and, um, uh, I, uh, uh, again, I just recommend all of you to go to the uh, to, to 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 Google this. Possibly, <laughs> yeah. It the uh, oh shoot, I, I don't I don't have his name here, but it'll pop up. Sure. It's, it's it's funny when he he was he was just talking about this, thinking about it, and came up with this word. So he 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 began talking about it, and and and. Uh, found out that he looked up, looked, uh, you know, Googled it, and there was no word like possibility. Well, the first thing he did was to capture that as a website address. And all of a sudden, there were these hundreds of people who said, you know what, I think I'm a possibility. Uh, fascinating. Anyhow, well, 
Uh, and, and Joel writes about possibilities in our in this month's newsletter, which you can read at fcfs.org. Uh, he talks about it. I never heard of the term possibilian until I read it in, in our newsletter. Uh, so I guess it opens up a lot of possibilities as long as you're looking at the data and the facts and, and, you, and you go with an unbiased view. All right, so let's go to Susan and Earl. Is, are you next, Susan and Earl? Yeah. Or Earl and Susan, I don't know, Earl's creeping up on the camera, here we go. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you uh, to Ryan. I'm in the same boat as Ken is, is feeling uh, how great it is to have you and people like you doing the work you're doing. Uh, I think a good picture of what winning looks like would be no more draconian laws. That's all I got. Yeah. No, no more I, draconian that's, laws. That's no that's more, where I'm going to. I agree. Yep. More draconian. I agree. Just have what would be the opposite of a draconian law, Earl? That's another talk. <laughs> okay, all right. Let's go to Mary Wall. Um I guess I was gonna I guess talk about I guess suspicion well, superstition in you know, early, I guess, religion and stuff. I it was bound mm -hmm. to evolve, you know, but um like things like I guess lepers were, you know sick because of sin or whatever. Now it gets Christians are more or less passing out, you know, anti-lepter medicine. Um, and I guess there must be some understanding that now it's germs or something. Anyway, um, I guess I might've mentioned things before about Carl Sagan said, said more or less that it, life was destined to evolve, you know, as a result of Big Bang, that more or less evolution also is an evolution of emotion. And I guess in terms, I guess, of society and stuff that laws and stuff are, you know, evolving as well, you know, evolution is behavioral as well as, you know, just physical. It was destined to, I guess, to evolve according to, I guess, Carl Sagan. So that makes me wonder if maybe there aren't, even if there is a God, there aren't some sort of laws like physics and the law of inertia and the idea that of an oppressed society, whether I guess it was, you know, the Germans that were alleged to be oppressed or whatever, tends to, I guess, um, in terms of inertia, swing the other way eventually, you know, so Anyway, there are laws, you know, whether it's evolution or physics or whatever, that seem to govern the universe, right. whether there is a God determining who wins what baseball game. So whatever. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Um, uh, I, I Certainly there are some laws. Uh, in the social sciences, we're reticent to, to say that there are any laws. Human, human behavior is just so difficult at, at the individual level to predict. Uh, in the aggregate, it's actually not terribly hard, but at the individual level, it's virtually impossible to predict what any, any one individual is going to do at any one time. True, but consider natural selection and desire to survive. What, what sure. organisms are more likely to survive? You know, even the basics, natural selection, um, would indicate that some organism that wanted to survive would be more likely to be so that there's, you know, on, on the basic level, that there's instinct, such as like beavers building dams, birds building nests, mm -hmm. or flying south in the winter or something like that's not inherent behavior so no, 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 no. Sure, I, I absolutely agree um but then you throw in something like altruism among humans altruism makes no sense from a natural selection perspective right um why would i give up my ability to reproduce my genes in order to save somebody else so as soon as you throw cognitive individuals right thinking individuals with morals and values that changes the calculus quite a bit. And that's why I would say from the social science standpoint, we cannot perfectly predict anybody's behavior on the basis of their biology alone. It just doesn't work, right? Sure. There, are, there, are, there are plenty of people who try, but it just doesn't work because we're complicated. We're crazy yeah. complicated. Argument, nature versus nurture is the individual's, I guess, birth right to hit itself against the universe, whether, you know, um, nature is arbitrary or not so far. yeah yeah and i would say it's both when it comes to understanding human behavior it's nature and nurture not nature right. versus yeah nature. i agree yeah. Okay. yeah well we're about to we have to wind up now we're, we're all out of time ryan i want to thank you so sure. much for your uh, your great great answers and your exhaustive research that you do you can learn more about ryan t craigan at ryan t craigan.com Obviously, he's a, he's a well-researched individual and can articulate what he has learned from his research, and we appreciate that. Surveys are very difficult to word, and 
That's just always a struggle to eliminate the bias. We can't, oh, and that's something that, I'm sorry we're all out of time for my question about bias. I got a long I just question. To say thank you. Thank you, Ryan. I really learned a lot from you tonight. Awesome. Thanks. I'm so glad that I, um, I, I carved out this time for uh, this discussion. I learned a lot, and I hope to hear from you again real soon. Awesome. Very Thank good. You. Well, All right, bye -bye. well, keep track of what's happening at the First Coast Free Thought Society for more uh, for more of Ryan T. Cragen in the next year or two. After his next book comes out, we'll have him back as, as long as he's willing to come back. Sure. Ryan, from the bottom of my heart, I appreciate you for doing what you do and spending your time, part of your evening with us this, this evening. And if we can, you can unmute new mics and uh, give them a round of applause and say thumbs up and all of that. Um, Thank you. Uh, uh, our next meeting is Monday uh, in July, July 8th. Uh, July 18th, I think it is. Um, and we're going to have a, another great discussion. And I appreciate everybody here who has participated in our conversations, uh, discussions, and et cetera, et cetera. Et, I went to Italy once and I had a tour guide, and he started every sentence with et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's how he began. <laughs> um, at any rate, Thank you for you, Ryan, and thank you for you, the First Coast Free Thought Society. Oh, Ryan, last my last comment to you is yep. thanks for taking our little bump in the road in stride. Sure. Oh, what bump okay. in the road? Right. Exactly. It didn't happen. I didn't yeah, say it anything. happens. Exactly. Well, clearly uh, you, know, you have people who are you're rattling some feathers, and I think that in and of itself speaks to the quality of your work you scare people and that, <laughs> that that's saying something i know that sounds crazy and i don't mean it to i hope you understand what no, no. absolutely coming from so yeah yeah the eighth graders are frightened all right <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate it right well madeline wherever you are um <laughs> it's your time to shine uh you can close out our meeting and again thank you to everybody especially ryan we'll see you next month Thanks, everyone.